Varmt välkomna till denna första konsert i en serie med världsledande organister från jordens alla hörn. Och det är en stor glädje att hälsa Ashley Groth, verksam som Master of Music i Nordic Cathedral. Välkommen som första gäst i denna serie som sker i samarbete med Lunds och Kalmar domkyrkor. It's an honor to have you as first guest Ashley in this series of international concerts which are co-produced with Lund and Kalmar cathedrals. And we will start in Norwich, where you uh, are working as Master of uh, Music in the Cathedral. Can you tell us uh, in general about the cathedral's music life? Yes, well, first of all, it's a great pleasure, um, a great privilege to be part of this online recital series. And uh, I'm very pleased to be representing something of the English uh, cathedral tradition in my uh, short concert for you. Um, but yes, I can certainly tell you about the musical life here in Norwich. Um, Norwich is a, a Benedictine cathedral that was founded back in 1096. And uh, that sort of Benedictine monastic um, foundation really informs a lot of the way that our life and our worship is constructed today um, around that, that basis of a monastery. Um, but of course, we have um, a choral tradition that's very similar to many English cathedrals. Um, typically, we would have uh, choral even songs sung most days uh, in the cathedral by the cathedral choir. And on a Sunday, we have a, a sung Eucharist, a mass in the morning and even sung in the afternoon. Um, we have a, a, a cathedral choir that comprises both boy choristers um, who range in age from eight to about 13 years. And then uh, girl choristers um, who sing separately from the boys. Um, and they are older. They have a range in age from 11 to 18 years. So from the secondary school um, pupils. And they um, obviously take the, the top soprano line. Um, and then the lower parts of the choir are sung by six, what we call lay clerks, who are professional salaried singers, and also by six choral scholars. And they, um, they do the same job as the lay clerks, really, but they are young apprentices who perhaps are just studying or hoping to embark on a career in music. So we give them an educational opportunity to be part of the choir here. Um, so um, that forms the sort of, uh, core of, of, of our choral worship, if you like. And then there are many other sort of extensions to that. We have um, an adult chamber choir, an amateur chamber choir who uh, um, sing concerts in the cathedral. We have a choir for very young children um, who gather on a Saturday morning. Um, so to really to nurture a love of music and singing in them. Um, of course, we'll talk more about the cathedral organ as well. Um, so it's a very uh, busy and vibrant musical tradition that goes back many centuries. If you describe a normal working week in the cathedral without a pandemic situation, what would it look, look like? Yes, I'm, I'm trying to remember what a normal week is like, having been away from normality for so many months now. But normally, um, the boys of the cathedral choir rehearse in this room that I'm in now, actually. This is our choir rehearsal room, what we call the song school. Um, and they rehearse in here for uh, about 45 minutes um, before their school lessons every day. Um, and then at the other end of the day, once school finishes, um, the boys on their days, they come back here um, to rehearse further. And then they're joined by the adults in the choir and choral evensong is sung at half past five, five thirty in the afternoon. Um, and then uh, on other days of the week, um, the girl choristers um, come up similarly after school to rehearse and sing evensong. Um, and then uh, because the girls choir uh, are not all drawn from the same school, they also rehearse on a Saturday morning. Um, and then on a Sunday, uh, we meet uh, to rehearse uh, ready for our sung Eucharist at half past 10. So we have a sung mass with the full choir at 10.30 on a Sunday morning. And then choral even song is sung a little bit earlier on a Sunday at 3.30. Um, so it's very much a routine that uh, goes on every single day, um, which I know is different to traditions in other parts of Europe, but it's very much the case that actually the emphasis on daily singing of choral even song. Yeah. And we will talk a bit about your background and you have been uh, educated in one of the world's most famous music environment, King's College in Cambridge. Can you tell us uh, about both your time as chorister and then you re did return as organ scholar? Yes, well, certainly. I mean, I, I've been immensely privileged to have had such a wonderful opportunity of musical training at King's College in Cambridge. Um, 
the family I come from is not a musical one um, and it's not a whole world that my parents had any experience of um, before I started as a chorister. Um, I think I was probably quite a, a musical child in our own uh, church, our own family church and enjoyed singing. Um, I started learning the piano at a, a reasonably young age. Um, but um, it was the opportunity of becoming a chorister which really opened the doors to a life in music for me. Um, and I think particularly that's something that is, is so fundamental to our English choral tradition and something that I feel very strongly about, as I know my colleagues do in other cathedrals, that actually um, giving young boys and girls the opportunity to sing on a daily basis at a very high standard um, provides such a wonderful uh, foundation and training for a life in music. And I can say in all honesty that everything I've done subsequently can all be traced back to that experience I had as singing as a young boy um, as a chorister. I learned uh, so much there from the late uh, Sir Stephen Clearbury, who was my choir master there. Um, and the uh, not only the musical lessons that uh, we learned from him and from the experience of being a chorister, but from the many other important qualities that um, you have to learn as a choir boy. Um, so. Uh, the ability to work to a very high standard at a young age um, and uh, the sort of lessons of professionalism um, of having to work in a team and having to organize your time well because of course even at that young age balancing the commitments of choir with school and so on um, and the opportunities that afforded in taking part in professional concerts and uh, touring um, so many wonderful things um, which uh, as I say, um, contributed so much to my whole musical life since then. Um, and then, as you said, I, I then went back there at university as an organ scholar, and that was something that I was always set on. From the moment I left uh, the choir at King's as a boy, I had always said, yes, I, I want to go back there and play the organ. I think I'd always seen the organ as a boy um, and you know, thought, well, I'd love to play an instrument like that. And I was very inspired by the organ scholars uh, who were playing there when I was a chorister. Um, and uh, again, really, that, that training as a young organist in such a, a public and pressurized environment really um, provided such a wonderful foundation for everything I've done since. The need to prepare really well so that you uh, feel confident performing at a very high standard, even under the pressure of having large congregations and broadcasting and recording and so on. Um, and also watching uh, Stephen Clearbury working with the choir and learning so many lessons from effectively being his assistant at a very young age um, taught me so much. Um, and so, um, yes, everything I've done since has really been drawn from that experience. Uh, what do you think is, um, do you have something extra you, which you have uh, from uh, the uh, years at King's, which you really have in your daily basis of both educating your choristers and uh, having your own uh, organ scholars right now, which you have brought from those days, which you can uh, have as a sample? Well, I mean, goodness, there, there are so many lessons, but um, off, and often I find myself thinking of my own chorister days and actually often of Stephen when I'm taking chorister rehearsals, when I perhaps get to a particular moment in a piece where I can remember him saying, you know, this, this bit is, you know, a bit that choristers always get wrong. <laughs> and, you know, there are certain moments like that. But actually more generally, um, I think what I learned above anything else from him and from that experience at King's was um, the need for preparation. And I don't just mean musically rehearsing, actually, um, because it's a very busy environment and there's always something else coming up. It's, it's so much as uh, depends on good planning and uh, preparation in that sense, because unless things are, are well organized and uh, you know, well thought out, then actually trying to make good music is very difficult. Um, yeah. And so in a sense, it's a question of not leaving anything to chance. You know, you, you, you have to prepare and plan so that you know everything is gonna go smoothly um, as far as possible, or at least that you're giving it the best possible opportunity to, to go smoothly. Um, and I think that applies both to choral training um, as it does to organ playing actually. Um, yeah. There's, I often think there's not, um, 
you know, there's not a magic formula. I wish, I wish there were, um, you know, that someone could say to me, well, if you just, just do this, then all your organ playing will be perfect. Then uh, if anyone knows that, that what that, you know, formula is, Blair, I'd love to hear. But I think um, really it just comes down to uh, planning, preparation and rehearsal, really. Yeah. I know when we talked earlier about it, uh, that the situation as organist is changing is so much between the different stages which you are doing in, in the typical Anglican tradition. You've been both organ scholar, then you've been assistant director of uh, music in Gloucester Cathedral, you've been organist at Westminster Abbey, and now you are master of music in Norwich. That um, from playing, uh, uh, just playing the organ, and now you're doing much more of uh, choral uh, work in, instead. Can you um, tell us a bit about the typical English tradition about these different uh, positions Good in role. English cathedral? Yes, certainly. Well, I think traditionally the, the thing with English organ music and the English choral tradition is that um, the organ and its music and the style of instruments um, and the music that the choir sing are so um, closely connected um, and the, the the choral repertoire has developed um, as you know through the centuries as the instruments the organs have have developed um, and then the different roles uh, have also developed similarly as the repertoire has developed and these these things sort of go hand in hand um, and so of course going back um, a number of decades now certainly going back a century it would typically have been the case that the cathedral organist uh, may have would have rehearsed the choir but then themselves gone to play the organ and to play an accompaniment whilst the choir sang really without any direction or perhaps with you know a, 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 a lay clerk or a lay vicar just beating time or starting indicating the start of, of a piece or whatever um, and um, of course as repertoire became more adventurous and uh, organ accompaniments became more intricate and choral music became more complicated um, it was obviously important and necessary to have a choral conductor and we wouldn't really think now that actually you could have a a, a choral performance um, that was entirely un, unconducted with you know just with somebody playing the organ um, you know a long distance away um, so those two things, the repertoire and the roles in the, in the English court tradition have developed alongside each other. Um, now, of course, it's the case that uh, the, the director of music uh, is training the choir and then principally conducting the choir in services in choral evening song and then has either a separate organist or an assistant um, who will spend most of his or her time playing the organ. Um, having said that, even that model is starting to change uh, in a number of English cathedrals where perhaps there's an organist um, who um, has nothing to do with the choir in terms of training um, or indeed a director of music who is not themselves an organist. Um, and uh, having said that, that can be a very successful model. Um, but having said that, um, because the organ music and the choral repertoire and the whole tradition are so closely aligned um, together. I think it is really important that whoever is directing the choir has a real understanding of that tradition and also of how the organ and the choir relate to each other. Um, and uh, so, um, so it, yes, an understanding of the tradition is very important. Um, but as you say, the, the slight anomaly is that in my case, you know, I went from being an assistant organist at Westminster Abbey and then uh, assistant director of music in Gloucester Cathedral, where I was principally playing the organ. Um, in Gloucester, I started to do more choir training. Um, and now I'm in the situation where I very, very rarely accompany the choir, almost never, um, and spend most of my time uh, directing the choir. And my organ playing tends to be more in recitals and concerts. Um, so it doesn't necessarily follow, of course, that a, a really expert organist or accompanist translates into a really excellent conductor and they're, they don't necessarily have the same skills. But at the same time, um, I think being a conductor in a cathedral choir uh, or church choir 
it's not necessarily the same as being a conductor of a concert choir because actually what you need is somebody who has a real understanding of the context of the liturgy and the the tradition the core tradition within the church um and who can be sensitive to that um and understand that it's not just a great big concert performance i don't know if that answers your question <laughs> definitely and it brings up us into the next question which really links the organ to the choir as you say in the anglican tradition mm -hmm. um and english organ music is not uh, so well known here in sweden uh, but interest has really increased for both choir and organ music from the anglican literature in recent years and the Swedish audience much better knows other countries' organ traditions, such as France and Germany. But how would you describe the Anglican organ tradition and what characterizes it? Well, I think like many different uh, genres of organ music, um, obviously the English organ tradition has uh, developed in tandem with the customs and the development of English organ building. And just as, you know, obviously the, you know, the French romantic organ tradition is so bound up with the great instruments of Cabaret Col and so on. Um, similarly, um, although there's not one, you know, standout uh, English organ builder in the same way as is the case with France, um, there is uh, definitely that you can trace the development of the music alongside the development of the instruments, um, of course. Um, and particularly, I think that that became the case, you know, um, from the sort of Victorian time onwards. Um, I've tried in my short recital program to sort of present, um, I suppose, uh, a snapshot of uh, English rep organ repertoire going from, you know, from the end of that uh, sort of 19th century through the 20th century. Um, so going from Samuel Sebastian Wesley, um, who was sort of the great, you know, first Victorian organist um, who held positions at many cathedrals. Um, and, you know, right through then the composers, which did so much to influence each other. Um, Hubert Parry was a great influence on Vaughan Williams, for example, um, and then in turn Vaughan Williams on Howells. Um, and then, of course, there's the great contribution of Sir Edward Elgar. Um, but I think um, also, like um, the organ in any context, um, English organs are very much bound up with the buildings that they are housed in and built for. And obviously, the organ is unlike any other instrument in, in the sense that, you know, you, uh, the, the, the instrument and the building are so completely connected as one and you can't just you know take the instrument and put it somewhere else it would be something completely different and i think the sort of architecture of uh, english cathedrals um are connected to the you know to the style style of organ building um and then in turn the music you know it's all it's all one thing um so i think particularly when you get to you know the the late 1800s um and uh, the sort of the, that's when the, the English core tradition really sort of started to come to the fore in the form that we know it now. And the organ music similarly, um, it draws on the very sonorous nature of the um, English organs um, that were emerging at that time, the romantic English organ with, you know, their very sonorous diapason tones and of their very orchestral palette, I think, which perhaps really, you know, marks them out as being different at that stage to, you know, the, the organs of France and Germany, particularly. Um, the idea that actually the organ could uh, encompass a snapshot of the, you know, the, the colour that a, a symphony orchestra would create um, with its, you know, its very instrumental sounding stops. Um, and because also the English organs in cathedrals were very much there for the purpose of accompanying the choir, um, a lot of the sounds that are heard in the English solo organ romantic repertoire are the kinds of sounds that uh, one expects to hear in the accompaniments for a lot of the big English romantic choral music. Um, so the, the choral music of uh, Parry, Vaughan Williams, Howells, Elgar, um, and as I say before that, just preceding that, Samuel Sebastian Wesley, um, it's very much, it's all the same sound world, of course, as the solo organ music. Um, and I think that's, it's this sort of um, sonorous orchestral nature of the whole thing, um, which makes it so distinctive. And I think very appealing um, 
I was just reading about some of these pieces that I'm playing tomorrow and uh, I came across um, a quote from Herbert Howes and he says actually um, that he composed out of sheer love of trying to make nice sounds. Um, and actually that's, that really does speak to the, to the whole English romantic organ and choral tradition. Um, it does have a wonderful warmth and color about it um, that is very much in harmony with the architecture of the buildings that it was designed for. And you're facing a major investment in Norwich to secure uh, both the finances for the future of the choirs and a major renovation of your cathedral organ. Mm. And here the bonds are connected between both Vesteros and Lund cathedrals and, and your cathedral as the English organ factory Harrison and Harrison are intended for the work. What will happen in Norwich in a few years? Well, I mean, I'm very pleased to say that actually um, the work is already beginning in its design phase, um, which is very exciting. It's a project that's been talked about for many decades, actually. Um, so the organ in the cathedral here is one of the largest of any English cathedral. It's the 105 stop organ that was built originally by the Norwich based firm of Hill, Norman and Beard. Um, and uh, it was last rebuilt substantially in 1942, uh, remarkably during the middle of the Second World War, um, because there was a fire uh, to the previous organ in 1938, which destroyed a lot of it. Um, so um, the organ is just over 75 years old. Um, and it's, it was so well constructed to start with that there's been very little work done on it at all for uh, 75 years or more. Um, so it is something that um, is, is overdue there. They, it's getting to the stage where there are a number of mechanical faults that become regular occurrences. Um, and the other um, crucial thing is that at the time the organ was designed, it was designed very much to speak into the nave of the cathedral, um, which is a very big open space. Um, now we're in the situation where the choir sings Choral Even Song on the, uh, on the other side of the organ screen um, on which the instrument sits. And also we have many occasions throughout the year where the whole cathedral is full of people um, and we need the organ to be able to speak uh, well to the east side as well as to the west side. So um, a lot of the work that Harrison and Harrison are going to be doing, as well as, of course, they're going to take the whole instrument away and uh, it'll be made, made good and made new. Um, but the scheme of it has been designed in such a way that the instrument will speak much more uh, evenly throughout both parts of the building. So that will involve um, quite a major um, change in the way the organ is laid out internally. Um, so um, there's going to be a new uh, great organ on the, on the screen, whereas previously the main great organ has been up in the Triforium Gallery. Um, and uh, there, there are going to be shutters so that this swell and the solo organs can speak um, both to the east and to the west. Um, and I think the, the essence of the project really is to retain the, the voice, if you like, of the current instrument with all of its qualities, um, because it speaks again with such warmth and color uh, as these you know, instruments we've been just been talking about into the building. But at the same time, it has things which uh, you know, are not really satisfactory for our use today. So uh, what we're really striving to do is to keep the character of the organ as it is now, but enable it to do its job better for our purposes. Um, but it's a very exciting project and we've been very fortunate to um, raise the finances over about a three year period. Um, and uh, the hope, if all goes to plan, is that Harrison and Harrison will uh, remove the current instruments in uh, the latter part of 2023, September 2023, if it all goes to schedule. And then we hope that we will have, no, I'm sorry, I've jumped a year, September 2022, in the hope that we'll have the restored organ back for Advent in 2023. So it's, um, it's all going to happen in the next couple of years. Marvellous. We really look forward to hearing mm. about the project. Many thanks, Ashley, for this interview. And we, we really look forward for your concert now, where you are going to presenting your music, which you are playing in between the pieces. So uh, after this interview, we warmly welcome you to both Lund, Kalmar and Westeros cathedrals to give concerts when the world opens again. So many thanks for now and uh, see you in future in Sweden. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to play and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the concerts.